I do some consulting work on American The feeling in the room was you probably... Don't ever say to her that her point about the shower points. She doesn't have any discussion on the ethical we laugh. It's more of a community. We're trying to back up her. doing in autism. Josh Lerner is co-founder and executive director of the Participatory Budgeting Project, a nonprofit organization that works with communities across North America to decide how to spend public monies. His book, Making Democracy Fun, explains why fun is an essential ingredient for strong democracy. We'll talk about why Americans love democracy in theory but often hate it in practice, about the history of games in politics, and about why participatory budgeting has fans and critics. Here's our conversation with Josh Lerner. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. You're here at Penn State to receive the inaugural uh, Lawrence and Lynn Brown Democracy Medal for, quote, exceptional innovation in the advancement of democracy. First, congratulations. Thank you. It's a huge honor. And uh, explain a little bit about how you came to the attention of this new institute, the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State. So I direct an organization called the Participatory Budgeting Project. It's a mouthful. Uh, the basic idea is that we give people the power to decide how to spend their tax dollars. So it's a very simple idea in theory that people should decide how to spend their tax dollars rather than experts or government officials deciding behind the scenes. So we took this idea that started out in Latin America and we translated it to the U.S. and have been spreading it across the country. So empowering people across uh, different cities to come out to meetings, brainstorm ideas for things they'd like to improve in their community, in their parks, their schools, their streets, turn those ideas into real projects, put them on a ballot, have a vote, and then actually get to decide how their tax dollars get spent, how millions of dollars get invested in their communities. Before we find out more about how that's working in the United States, I want to talk a little bit about where this all began. It began in Brazil in 1989. Explain what was happening there and what, if anything, can be translated as North America is not Latin America. Sure, and, and we tend to think that we know how to do democracy best in the U.S., and what could we possibly learn from a country like Brazil? But there's actually a lot of very exciting innovations that are taking place in Latin America, especially for democracy. And after dictatorship in Brazil in 1989, people were really frustrated with the lack of opportunities to have a meaningful say, and a new party came into power in many of the cities and they tried to change the budget process, change the political process, so that it wasn't how much power, or how much money or influence you had that determined what got invested in your community. Instead, it was one person, one vote. Uh, but not just to elect someone to decide for you, but actually to directly decide what government does. When you first saw this, you thought it was interesting, but it didn't immediately hit you as something that was transferable to the United States. What happened? What changed? Yeah, when I, when I first heard about participatory budgeting, I had the reaction probably a lot of people do, that it sounds boring, it sounds kind of wonky. And it wasn't until I started to see people in Toronto, where I was living at the time, people in public housing, very low-income people who don't have a lot of power, get really excited about this process, about deciding how to spend money in their buildings, and seeing how rare it was that they had real power and how exciting this was for them that I started to see the potential of it. And so I went to Latin America for a year, saw how it worked firsthand down there, came back to the U.S. and started to share this idea with people. And most folks said, no, nah, that wouldn't work here. Maybe that works in Brazil, or Argentina, or Europe, or Africa, or Asia, but never in the U.S. Uh, Which is funny because we are so pro-democracy. We're trying to spread it everywhere. And yet you say, and I think this is great, you, you write in your book, you borrow a phrase from Oscar Wilde who says, the problem with socialism, we can change that to democracy, is that it takes up too many evenings. And it's boring. Right. So we, we love democracy in theory, but we hate it in practice. So we, we pride ourselves on being a democratic country, but we really despise our democratic institutions, our government. Uh, we don't we want hate to come going out. to those meetings. We hate going to those boring zoning hearings or, or uh, town meetings. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, you talk about uh, Joe Moore, who right. is the first American. In fact, they consider him an American trailblazer for being the first American. He represents the, the 49th Ward in Chicago to embrace this whole idea of participatory budgeting. Tell us a little bit about Joe Moore. Yeah, he's a city council member, or alderman, they call them in Chicago. And he had been in office for around 20 years when we first met. It's in the far northeast corner of Chicago. 
And he was really struck by this idea of giving people in his community some real power over money. When he first heard about it, he thought, sounds great, too bad I'm not the mayor. Too bad I can't control this or do this for the city budget. And then he realized that he actually did have a pot of money just for his ward, for his part of the city. Because in, in each ward gets something like $1.3 million Correct. for capital improvements. And this is distributed to all of the wards and typically what the, the, uh, the alderman would decide uh, or, or the... Exactly. How, how it would be spent. He would sit down with a couple of his staff for an hour or two and decide how the money gets spent. And he may have his finger on the pulse of certain issues in the community, but not others. And so he said, you know, let's try engaging the whole community in this process. Uh, I should mention, too, that, that he had a strong incentive to do this, that he was almost kicked out of office the prior election for being out of touch with the community, which, again, something we see all across the country. Elected officials have been in office for too long. They get out of touch. We get frustrated. We elect someone new. They get out of touch. We elect someone new. It's never ending cycle. It doesn't really solve the problem. Well, the good thing about uh, Joe Moore's taking this on is that he won by a landslide. People felt suddenly empowered. It worked out very well for him politically. So at the next election, after doing participatory budgeting, uh, so beforehand, he won in a tight runoff with just 51% uh, of the votes. After launching this program, he won with 72% and a landslide. But the more important thing is for the community. Uh, the community really felt empowered in this, and hundreds of people came out to brainstorm ideas. 400 to a meeting that typically would only get a couple right. of dozen. And then in, in this community, um, 1,600 people ended up voting to decide on how to spend this $1.3 million. Tell me exactly how it happened. So a committee would, would work with Joe Moore and say, these are the kinds of projects we think are important. They'd research the viability of these projects and then put it out to the public to vote. What, what, how difficult is the voting process? The, the challenging part is taking ideas and turning them into projects that can actually be done. And that's the part that we usually underestimate how much work that is. So we have typical community meetings where we ask people for their ideas. And we expect that in two hours they'll come up with good ideas. And it's really not, not fair. It takes experts and staff months or weeks to come up with good ideas. And so for participatory budgeting, that's the starting point, is these brainstorming sessions, these town hall meetings. But from there, you want to take those ideas and turn them into viable projects. You have to talk with experts at the city. You have to go out and do more research. You have to have a lot of discussion. So that takes several months. And that's where you have that mixing of the technical expertise and local knowledge. And at the end of that process, you get a bunch of really great projects, things that have been vetted by the city or the government, that have a price tag on them, that people are really get behind. And then you put those in the ballot for a vote. And it's often really hard for people actually to decide what to fund because they're all good projects. Uh, so we often think about government waste and what's money going towards. But when you see dozens of projects that have a direct positive impact on your schools, your parks, your streets, your libraries, People want to fund them all, and that's when they realize government is hard, that we have limited resources and unlimited needs, and people really start to understand how difficult it is to make these decisions. And they need to, when they see this dozen or so projects that are, that are being voted on, they can see, well, which one will benefit the community as a whole rather than my little slice of the, you know, park here. Exactly. And people usually start out with <clears throat> their self-interest. So they start out thinking about what can I get for my community. But then they see all the other projects in the ballot and start to realize there's other parts of the community that also have important needs. So, for example, in New York, where we're also doing participatory budgeting, there was a great story in the New York Times, a uh, teacher at a school who got involved because he wanted some improvements to his school's the bathrooms. facilities. The, Actually, no, before okay, the bathrooms. Okay. Was so <laughs> he wanted originally, he wanted improvements to the uh, kind of garden facilities at his school. And he got involved, and then through this process, he had to go do research in other schools in the district and find out what their needs were. And he went to a school in a lower-income district and found out that the bathrooms there in this public school, there were no doors in the stalls. And so kids just weren't using the bathrooms and they were holding it in, or you know, it wasn't a good situation. So he actually stopped advocating for his own school and started advocating for this other school that he'd never because been in before. Yeah, because suddenly he sees the other needs in this community. Exactly, and that's what this process does. It lets people see how many different needs there are, and through a really safe and thoughtful process, let them reassess what's best for the whole community. So it seems that this would all enhance everyone's sense of community. 
It, it really does, and we find a lot of people, again, they come in with these particular needs, and they walk out thinking, you know, I may have won funding or not, but the important thing is it was a fair process, and that everyone's voices were heard, and they had a real say. But there are some who say, well, wait a minute. We're the experts. We're the one in the planning. Uh, we're, we have degrees in, in urban planning and that sort of thing. We know this is, sounds great in theory, but I'm not going there. Yeah, and it has been spreading very quickly, and this is so new still that we're only starting to see the potential of this. Uh, so in Latin America, it's spread all over the continents, and I think we're just starting to see that now, so it's still pretty early. There are officials that we talk with who say, you know, I was elected to decide, that's my job, I don't want to abdicate my responsibility. <clears throat> I respect that, that's, a, that's one approach, but I don't think the elected officials know everything. And we've seen that deferring everything to officials and uh, experts hasn't worked so well for our economy. That the whole financial crisis was largely a result of us not being involved and saying, okay, you experts, you decide how, how things get run. And what we're hearing across the country is that people recognize this is not working very well and they want something better. They want a better way. They want to have a real say in how their money gets spent and recognizing that there's some technical expertise, but there's also a lot of local knowledge. People know their schools, they know their parks, they know their neighborhoods. And if you combine that local knowledge with expertise, elected officials can actually do a better job of governing because they're more connected to the community. They're not so isolated. There are supporters, obviously, of right. participatory budgets, but there are also critics, those who say the process is too slow, it's agonizingly slow. Uh, communities may vote on something, and I should add that even 16-year-olds are allowed to vote, mm -hmm. uh, but then local agencies may say this isn't happening. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you get around those kinds of problems? Yeah, so I think it's important to compare this to the status quo. So right now we have decisions that are mostly made behind closed doors by a handful of people that often aren't really supported by the public. And so things will be built or proposed, and, and then afterwards people will protest. And you'll have hearings and say, you know, why did we have that new housing go up? Why did we have those new renovations? And that's very costly for governments, having to constantly respond to that criticism, change plans. What this does is it brings people into the discussion before, so they don't have to just complain, but they can actually proactively propose ideas. And what we see is that it reduces some of those costs of people protesting, having to change plans. It makes sure that money is spent from the get-go on the top needs of the community, not just the top priorities of the technical experts, but there's that real back and the forth. The perceived needs and the real the needs on the ground. Needs. And then also people find really creative ways to get things done, to meet needs for, for less money and to um, make the most of our very limited resources. If they have some, some stake, some skin in the game, then they will work really hard to find uh, cheaper ways to get things done, to find matching funds, bring in other resources. We find actually that places that do participatory budgeting, it brings in additional resources from elsewhere. People will go and look for other funds from the county, from the state, from other jurisdictions because they see these are good projects and they need more funding. You wrote a book, Making Democracy Fun, How G Game Design Can Empower Citizens and Transform Politics. Games? I, I, <laughs> explain what role games play in politics and in, in democracy. Right now, the main role of games is that politics and democracy is largely a spectator sport, and we're on the outside observing it, and it's very unfortunate. Um, I think that there's a lot more potential for us to actually be active players in democracy and in politics. And I originally got into this when I had some friends who were game designers and learned about all of the thinking and, and great innovation that went into designing games that were engaging people in meaningful ways. And they're really, that are all about making decisions. When you're playing a game, you're constantly deciding, do you go left, do you go right, where do you kick the ball, all these decisions. And they're crafting these really engaging uh, experiences for people, and I didn't see any of that thought going into planning, uh, organizing, community work, local politics. Instead, we have this model of three minutes at the mic, where you come up to the front of the room, speak for three minutes, sit back down, and usually nothing happens as a result. And the people in the audience are just thinking about what they're going to say. They aren't even listening to the presenter. And most, Oftentimes. most decisions are already made beforehand. And so I think everyone actually recognizes it's a horrible model. It's painful. It's pointless. But we keep doing it. 
And we could change the way that those meetings work. We could change the way people can engage in democracy. And so what the book is really about is how can we redesign democracy to make it more engaging? You actually talk about five kinds of games that are right. particularly uh, relevant to democracy and, and also uh, 26 different game mechanics, things that need to be part of the game to make them worthwhile and, and work in this, uh, this context. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so games are very complex systems. So it's not just about uh, adding points to something kind of like MSG, you just sprinkle it in and suddenly it tastes good. That games are very thought through structures and there's a lot that goes into them. And if you look at game designers and the theory and the work they do, that there is um, you know, kind of a mechanics to it. You can think of gears turning to make up this big system of a game. And so what I did is I looked at those mechanics of games. What are the gears that make games work? And how can we take those and translate them to community meetings, campaigns, events? Part of that is through games, actually playing games, uh, icebreaker games, team building games, things like that. But also it's about redesigning decision making and changing those processes so that they work more like games. So for example, having really clear rules when you start a process. So if you go into a meeting, you know what the rules are, who can say what, what will be decided, when. Having some competition, and competition can be good. It can be really collaborative, actually. You can but are there winners and losers? Let so there, there are always winners and losers <laughs> in politics in the sense that there are limited resources, limited things. Um, but you can make that competition more collaborative and artificial. So thinking about soccer is a great example. Soccer is a very competitive sport. You have two teams going at it. It's also very collaborative. People in each team are collaborating intensely because of that competition. And what I found is that Competition can drive people to collaborate in really productive ways, and it doesn't have to be winner take all. So a lot of the experiences I talk about in my book, and actually participatory budgeting as well, they are kind of group against system. So you're competing against the system. Like in solitaire, you compete against the system. You have cards, and the system of the cards is trying to, to beat you, essentially. In participatory budgeting, you have groups of people coming up with projects, trying to develop them, within the systemic constraints of here's how much money we have, here's what's technically feasible, what isn't feasible. And I find that when people are given those rules up front and are empowered to have some competition, they come up with really great ideas. And then the most important thing is to have real outcomes, real measurable outcomes, so that you know if you participate, what will come of it. Uh, and it's not just that you'll be in a meeting, you'll go home and that's the last you'll hear of it. In predatory budgeting, for example, you come out to a meeting and you'll decide how to spend a million dollars or however much money it is. And that's really meaningful for people. As innovative as this sounds, uh, you say in your book that there's actually a long history of games in politics. You go back to the carnivals in the Middle Ages. Right. So, and unfortunately, games have usually been used as a distraction from politics, the kind of bread and circus, that we have some circus on the side and we give people a little bit of bread and they'll be okay. Uh, and so games can be very manipulative. They can also be disempowering. If you think about a lot of the electoral politics and the horse race of electoral politics, it puts us really on the sidelines and we're constantly watching other people duke it out. But there's also a history of people in different organizations and communities in Latin America and the U.S. using games and meetings to take on more power, to take on more control over their communities. So far, we have the United Nations, the World Bank, the Obama right. administration. Those three organizations <laughs> really support participatory budgeting. And with, with Congress always embroiled in budgeting battles, I'm wondering, can... This, what you're talking about, number one, making democracy more fun and participatory budgeting, could Congress use this? I think so. Uh, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> it takes some time, and that's one of the big lessons that I've learned from this is that democracy is really hard. So if you take a simple idea like you should be able to decide how your tax dollars get spent, sounds simple. But it's really complicated, actually. It's a lot more complicated than we realize, and you need to make sure that you have the systems in place so that you can bring in that expertise when necessary. You can reach out to everyone in the community. And building up those processes, we spent hundreds of years building up processes for representative democracy. 
I think we need to spend several years building up processes for participatory democracy to let real people into that discussion. And it'll take some time, but I think it actually it could work at the national level as well. We've seen participatory budgeting work in the state level elsewhere in other countries. So it, this can be scaled up. It just takes a lot of thinking and, and hard work. One of the pluses about this uh, participatory democracy, you say, is that it increases trust in government and it's bipartisan. That's right. So the idea that you get to decide the issues that affect your lives, I don't think that's Republican or Democratic. Uh, it's small d democratic and that that's what we all should be doing in this country. And I find we've worked in Republican communities, Democratic communities, the whole mix. And when you start talking about those concrete needs in communities, everyone wants better schools. Everyone wants a better um, park spaces. Everyone wants better communities. And a lot of the kind of rhetoric of politics tends to fade away when you get into the de details and see, here's how much money we have. How are we going to spend it? If you look at where this is happening right now, you mentioned New York City. We talked about Chicago, in Vallejo, in California, in Toronto. Uh, it's it's mm -hmm. big, especially where they're talking about um, how to use uh, public funds for for housing. Um, so, But I, I'm just wondering, where else is there interest and do you find that it's more uh, uh, in democratic ruled cities or republican ruled cities? Yeah, so there's been interest across the board and um, across the political spectrum as well. In New York, we're actually working in some Republican communities as well, which is very rare in New York City. Okay. <laughs> uh, but there it's really resonated in Republican areas, the basic idea that you shouldn't have big government deciding for you, that you should actually get to decide how your money gets spent. And people get that. So we've seen those cities that you mentioned. In Boston, there's been a great process just for young people. So youth ages 12 to 25 decided how to spend a million dollars from the city budget, which is amazingly empowering for these young people who normally don't have much of a say. And here they were deciding how to spend a lot of money from the city budget. And they're, they're starting up that process for the second year now. You've been doing this long enough. Uh, so I'm wondering if you get someone 16 to participate in this and to vote on which project is funded, do you find that that translate to make them a more active person in general elections, for example, when, when they're of voting age? Yeah, so there's been some good research on this that shows that people who participate actively are more likely to join a community organization, go to a meeting, speak up, uh, read newspapers, stay informed. And we're starting to see some signs that they're more likely to vote as well. It's still pretty early on, but in Chicago, for example, in, in the 49th Ward, where they've done participatory budgeting, the uh, voter turnout rate in the election following this was three percentage points higher than across the city, even though normally it was the same as the city average. So there was a significant bump there. You've been at this now for more than 10 years. Is there one particular story that stands out to you that this is why I'm doing this? This is why this is worth investing in? Yeah, so there was a woman that I interviewed in Rosario, Argentina, who had gotten involved in participatory budgeting. She was a teacher, kind of middle class, uh, and she told me the story after she had been participating for a year. She was dropping off her son at rugby practice at a, a sports facility that was near one of the shanty towns, a very poor, dangerous uh, neighborhood in, in Rosario. And she dropped him off, and then she was on her way back home, and it was the evening, it was kind of cold and rainy, and she saw this family walking on the side of the roads with grocery bags weighing them down, the, carrying a kid, and she drove by them, and then she stopped and went back and offered them a ride. Total strangers outside of a shanty town, uh, not where you normally would stop to pick up hitchhikers. And she gave them a ride, drove them home, dropped them off, and asked her, you know, why, why did she do this? Didn't seem very, very wise. And she said that you know, she had spent the past year meeting with people just like that, sitting across the table from them, talking about how to improve their parks and their streets and their schools. And that they were, she now saw them as, as neighbors. Even if she didn't know those people individually, she knew people like them and felt like she had a responsibility to them. And it really changed how she engaged with her city, with her neighbors. That's really and interesting. And opened her up to new experiences. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I'm kind of curious what made you so interested in, in civic action and democracy. Did you grow up in a very political family or, or why is this important to you? I didn't grow up in a particularly activist family. Um, 
I think one of the turning points for me is that I was in a graduate school getting a planning degree and kind of on that expert track of developing that expertise so I could decide. And, and I started to see people who got engaged who weren't experts and how much they had to add to the discussion. And some of the residents in public housing in Toronto, that they had great ideas for their buildings that I wouldn't have known about as a technical expert. And realizing that if we brought them in, we could actually make better decisions together. And so it's giving people a chance to really speak, having a, um, a voice and really listening to them. People don't always have the best ideas at first, but if you give them some support, if you give them information, if you give them time, they can make really good decisions. What do you see as the greatest threats to democracy and why does that matter? The greatest threat for me is that most of us actually hate democracy in practice. <laughs> that it's very painful for us to engage in democracy. That you go to boring meetings, it's very contentious, people arguing with each other. And we've lost touch with what democracy could be, which is about us coming together and deciding on the issues that affect our lives and making these decisions together in a collaborative process. And I think if we keep thinking of democracy as electing someone else to decide for you, that we're really limiting ourselves. So I'd like to just expand the notion of what's possible with democracy, that democracy can be all of us making real decisions. It can be enjoyable. It doesn't have to be this kind of civic chore that you should do, but you don't really want to do. And there's so much else that democracy could be. All right. Thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Josh Lerner. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find more information on the participatory budgeting project. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.